So I'm going to read chapter two from Andrea Dworkin's Right Wing Women. It's probably my favorite chapter in the whole damn book, but every time I open it, I find something new. But this one, I tend to read to myself on hard days, and it makes me feel better because it's just so awesome that way. It's entitled The Politics of Intelligence, and it opens with a quote from Virginia Woolf's diary, written October 25th, 1920. Why is life so tragic? <laughs> so like a little strip of pavement over an abyss. I look down, I feel giddy. I wonder how I'm ever to walk to the end. It's a feeling of impotence, of cutting no ice. Hell the start. <laughs> I might be throwing commentary in on this. Um, we'll see how that goes. Men hate intelligence in women. It cannot flame, it cannot burn, it cannot burn out and end up in ashes, having been consumed in adventure. It cannot be cold rational, ice. No warm womb would tolerate a cold, icy, splendid mind. It cannot be jubilant, and it cannot be morbid. It cannot be anything that does not end in reproduction or whoring. It cannot be what intelligence is, a vitality of mind that acts directly in and on the world without mediation. Heads up, if you haven't already read this book, In Right Wing Women, she is often talking about this, um, you know, this false dichotomy of the, the Madonna whore thing. She calls it the wife and the prostitute. God. <laughs> Someone cutting stuff outside. I'm just gonna go with it. It's part of it. But how the icy splendid plants are not tolerated either. Okay. Um, Without mediation. Indeed, wrote Norman Mailer. I doubt if there will be a really exciting woman writer until the first, first whore becomes a call girl and tells her tale. Well, didn't he just meet his match? And Mailer was being generous because he endowed the whore with the capacity to know, if not to tell. She knows something firsthand, something worth knowing. And in Anais Nin's defense, you know, she wrote porn because she knew it would sell. And Mm. Oh, I'm gonna rein it in. Okay, uh... She knows something firsthand, something worth knowing. Genius, wrote Edith Wharton, more realistically, is of small use to a woman who does not know how to do her hair. <laughs> oh, so many things to say about that. Okay, intelligence is a form of energy. Of course, uh, okay. You know, they say that it's like 70% of how you look, and 10% like of what you say, and some percent of how people, you know, you make people feel, and all this. And what a drag. You know, I, I can't think of a time where any woman was permitted to apply that to a man. <laughs> you know, it's always like, you know, women are, are supposed to be the ones endowed with the capacity for shallowness and what a reversal. Oofed. Oh. Uh, intelligence is a form of energy, a force that pushes out into the world. It makes its mark, not once, but continuously. It is curious, penetrating. Without the light of public life, discourse, and action, it dies. It must have a field of action beyond embroidery and scrubbing toilets or wearing fine clothes. It needs response, challenge, consequences that matter. Intelligence cannot be passive and private throughout a lifetime. Kept in secret, kept inside, it withers and dies. Out, the outside can be brought to it. It can live on bread and water locked up in a cell, but barely. Florence Nightingale, in her first tract, Cassandra, said that intel intellect died last in women. Desire, dreams, activity, and love all died before it. Intelligence does hang on, 
because it can live on almost nothing. Fragments of the world brought to it by husbands or sons or strangers or, in our time, television or the occasional film. Imprisoned, intelligence turns into self-haunting and dread. Isolated, intelligence becomes a burden and a curse. Undernourished, intelligence becomes like the bloated belly of a starving child, swollen, filled with nothing the body can use. It swells like the starved stomach as the skeleton shrivels and the bones collapse. It will pick up anything to fill the hunger, stick anything in, chew anything, swallow anything. Jose Carlos came home with a big bag of crackers he found in the garbage, wrote Carolina Maria de Jesus, a woman of the Brazilian underground underclass in her diary. When I saw him eating things out of the trash, I thought, and if it's been poisoned? Children can't stand hunger. The crackers were delicious. I ate them thinking of that proverb, he who enters the dance must dance. And as I was also hungry, I ate. The intelligence of women is traditionally starved, isolated, imprisoned. Traditionally and practically, the world is brought to women by men. They are the outside on which female intelligence must feed. The food is poor, orphans gruel. This is because men bring home half-truths, ego-laden lies, and use them to demand solace or sex or housekeeping. The intelligence of women is not out in the world, acting on its own behalf. It is kept small, inside the home, acting on behalf of another. This is true even when the woman works outside the home, because she is segregated into women's work, and her intelligence does not have the same importance as the lay of her ass. And I must say, you know, it would be easy to say, okay, she's writing about the 1950s if you're in the upper middle class and woman and working on your own and able to support yourself. She was writing this in the 80s, and if you were not <laughs> even a middle class woman able to support yourself, um, these words are haunting. They're absolutely devastating because if you try to talk to somebody who doesn't have your experience about this, they straight up won't believe you. It's one of those things where, you know, if you don't have the experience, there is nothing that anyone can say that will make you understand. It's like, <laughs> I was talking to a friend one day about the experience of making, you know, like 625 or some something an hour and not having a bank account and having to take some number of buses over to the King Supers to pay $7 to cash a check, you know, which is over an hour of my life, um, not just in work, but also in transportation to and fro and standing in the damn line and getting looked down on by the clerk who's, you know, it's just a, it's, a, it's just a maze of, you know, and that's not even including the, the obligatory street harassment that goes with that. Um, so, you know, when people talk about how, oh, things, times have changed, it's like, well, I'm very happy for you that you don't have experience with how much they have not changed, but for so many, they have not. <clears throat> Men are the world, and women use intelligence to survive men. Their tricks, desires, demands, moods, hatreds, disappointments, rages, greed, lust, authority, power, weakness. The ideas that come to women come through men, in a field of cultural values controlled by men, in a political and social system controlled by men, in a sexual system in which women are used as things. As Catherine A. McKinnon wrote, in the one sentence that every woman should risk her life to understand, man fucks woman, subject, verb, object. So this is the meat and potatoes. Like certainly men can experience poverty just like men can experience the powerlessness of childhood, but then men graduate more often than not. And even when they don't overcome poverty or, or even like lower middle classness, say you are an employee and middle management is almost universally women because they're cheaper, you might be susceptible to that notion that, oh, well, this woman is em employed at a higher level than me, so feminism won and, and, and men are failing and falling behind. It's like, you know, <laughs> 
Sansara Taylor said it best when she said it's uh, it's not a measure of I'm gonna butcher this in my in my paraphrasing, but um, it's not a measure of a, women being equal when there's a female CEO or even five, or if all of middle management is a woman, is is comprised of women. Um, it's who's scrubbing the toilets, you know. Who scrubs your toilet? You clean your own toilet? Do you do your own dishes? You wash your own laundry? Make your own bed? You know, who is doing this? Um, it's not that men never do it. It's the, the vast majority of women in prostitution, in housekeeping, in all kinds of trafficking. They're women. Um, moving on. Men are the field of action in which female intelligence moves. But the world, the real world, is more than men. Certainly more than what men show of themselves and the world to women. And women are deprived of the real world. The male always intervenes between her and it. Some will grant that women might have a particular kind of intelligence. Essentially small, picky, good with details, bad with ideas. Oh yeah, that, that, I don't know where this came from, this idea that the women are concrete and men are abstract. Like that took me a long time to even hear because in my experience it was reversed. Just in just in my life experience, you know, the women were always escaping into these lofty concepts and they want to talk about things and discuss their ideas and the men were like that or you know, whatever. They just, just it was it was shocking to me to hear that for the first time and then to see it pervade afterwards. Where did this even come from? And, and then I found out, and I was like, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> sort of. You know, in the land of reversals, here we are. Um, bad with ideas. Some will grant, in fact, insist that women know more of the good, that women are more cognizant of decency or kindness. This keeps intelligence small and tamed. Some will grant that there have been women of genius. After the women of genius is dead, woman of genius is dead. The greatest white writers in the English language have been women: George Eliot, Jane Austen, Virginia Woolf. They were sublime, and they were all of them shadows of what they might have been. But the fact that they existed does not change the categorical perception that women are basically stupid, not capable of intelligence without the ex exercise of which the world as a whole is impoverished. Mm -mm -mm. Women are stupid and men are smart. Men have a right to the world and women do not. And you know, if you want to think that we've graduated from this, walk to your, I mean, I, strap on a pair of sits if you don't already have them and walk to your place of business and walk home every day for a week on the street where everyone can see you. Give it a try, we'll see what happens. Um, 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 um. A lost man is a lost intelligence. A lost woman is a lost name the function. Mother, housekeeper, sexual thing. Classes of men have been lost, have been thrown away. There have always been mourners and fighters who refuse to accept the loss. There is no mourning for the lost intelligence of women because there is no conviction that such intelligence was real and was destroyed. Intelligence is, in fact, seen as a function of ma masculinity, and women are despised when they refuse to be lost. Women have stupid ideas that do not, do not deserve to be called ideas. Maribel Morgan writes an awful, silly, terrible book in which she claims that women must exist for their husbands, do sex and be sex for their husbands. There's some footnotes here. I'm going to skip the footnotes. They're awesome. Buy the book. D.H. Lawrence writes vile and stupid essays in which he says the same thing, basically with many references to the divine phallus. But D.H. Lawrence is smart. Anita Bryant says that cocksucking is a form of human cannibalism. She decries the loss of the child who is the sperm. Norman Mailer believes that lost ejaculations are lost sons and on that basis disparages male homosexuality, masturbation, and contraception. But Anita Bryant is stupid and Norman Mailer is smart. Is the difference in the style with which these same ideas are delivered, or in the penis? Mailer says that a great writer writes with his balls. Novelist Cynthia Ozick 
asks Mailer in which color ink he dips his balls. Who is smart and who is stupid? If an idea is stupid, presumably it is stupid whether the one who articulates it is male or female. But that is not the case. Women, undereducated as a class, yeah, welcome to my avalanche of mispronounced words. And I, I'm not taking down that video where I called um, Redding Reading. Reading Jowl, oh my god. Oh, face plant forever. But the case in point, you know, I'm just not surrounded by people who are saying these words and not English and uh, fuck it. <laughs> oh god. Um, um, but that is not the case. Women undereducated as a class do not have to read. It's going to be, uh, Asclecius to know that man, that a man plants the sperm, the child, the son. Women are the soil. She brings forth the human he created. He is the originator, the father of life. Women can, can have their own provincial, moralistic sources for this knowledge. Clergy, movies, gym teachers. The knowledge is common knowledge. Respected in the male writers because the male writers are respected. Stupid in women because women are stupid as a condition of birth. Women articulate received knowledge and are laughed at for doing so. <laughs> but male or called hound. What, yeah, some some guy put that in my comments. He decided it was worth his while to just say this one word. It's like wow. Thanks, darling. <laughs> you know, just, this is what you're doing with your fucking time, man. Come on. Uh, but male writers with the same received ideas are acclaimed as new, brilliant, interesting, even rebellious, brave, facing the world of sin and sex forthrightly. Women have ignorant, moralistic prejudices. Men have ideas. To call this a double standard is to indulge in cruel euphemism. This gender system of evaluating ideas is a sledgehammer that bangs female intelligence to a pulp, annihilating it. Mailer and Lawrence have taken on the world always. They knew they had a right to it. Their prose takes that right for granted. And it is the gravitational field in which they move. Maribel Morgan and Anita Bryant come into this world as middle-aged women and try to act in it. Of course they are juvenile and imprecise in style, ridiculous even. Both Mailer and Lawrence have written volumes that are as ridiculous, juvenile, despite what they take for granted as men, despite their sometimes mastery of the language, despite their genuine accomplishments, despite the, the beauty of a story or a novel. But they are not called stupid, ev stupid even when they are ridiculous. When the ideas of Lawrence cannot be distinguished from the ideas of Morgan, either both are smart or both, both are stupid. And similarly, Mailer and Bryant, and similarly with Mailer and Bryant, only the women, however, deserve to get our contempt. Are Anita Bryant's ideas pernicious? Then so are Norman, Norman Mailers. Are Maribel Morgan's ideas side-slappingly funny? Then so are D.H. Lawrence's. A woman must keep her intelligence small and timid to survive, or she must hide it altogether and hide it through style, or she must go mad like clockwork to pay for it. She will try to find the nice way to exercise intelligence, but intelligence is not ladylike. Intelligence is full of excesses. Rigorous intelligence abhors sentimentality and women must be sentimental to value the dreadful silliness of the men around them. Morbid intelligence abhors the cheery sunlight of positive thinking and eternal sweetness. And women must be sunlight and cheery and sweet or the woman could not bribe her way with smiles through a day. Wild intelligence abhors any narrow world and the world of women must stay narrow, or the woman is an outlaw. No woman could be Nietzsche or Rimbaud without ending up in a whorehouse or lobotomized. And many were, and many are. They, do, they still do ECT. Oh my God. I can't believe they're still doing ECT, the fuckers. <sighs> anyway. Any vital intelligence has passionate questions, aggressive answers, but women cannot be explorers. There can be no Lewis and Clark of the female mind, or North. 
Even restrained intelligence is restrained not because it is timid, as women must be, but because it is cautiously weighing impressions and facts that come in from the outside that the timid dare not face. A woman must please, and restrained intelligence does not seek to please. It seeks to know through discernment. Intelligence is also ambitious. It always wants more. Not more of being fucked, not more pregnancy, but more of a bigger world. A woman cannot be ambitious, ambitious in her own right without also being damned. We take girls and send them to schools. It is good of us, because girls are not supposed to know anything much. And in many other societies, girls are not sent to school or taught to read and write. In our society, such a generous one to women, girls are taught some facts, but not inqu inquiry or the passion of knowing. Girls are taught in order to make them compliant. And, I, you know, I would argue that this is true for much of, of public education, at least. Not just for women and girls, but generally. You know, a true teacher will demand that you surpass them and challenge them, you know. They will rail against regurgitation. And I have been blessed with very good teachers, so I looked out. They were mostly women, I must add. Women who would be Andrea's age, would have been Andrea's age. <sighs> Girls are taught in order to make them compliant. Intellectual adventurousness is drained, punished, ridiculed out of girls. We use schools first to narrow the girl's scope, her curiosity, then to teach her certain skills necessary to the abstract husband. Girls are taught to be passive in relation to facts. Girls are not seen as the potential originators of ideas or the potential searchers into the human condition. And I must say, this is true even of um, educated women. You know, educated women are just as guilty of being these self-appointed guru th thought lords and, and coming out women like, oh, let me tell you all about it, darling. I have no interest in listening to other women in my experience, unless they're great. I met very few great women. I met a few. It's not many. Um, y you know, and that includes feminists, even radical feminists. Sadly. Girls are not seen as potential originators of ideas or the potential searchers into the human condition. Good behavior is the intellectual goal of a girl. A girl with intellectual drive is a girl who has been cut down to size, who has to be cut down to size. An intelligent girl is supposed to use that intelligence to find a smarter husband. Simone de Beauvoir set, settled on, set, sorry, I have no idea how to pronounce this man's name. This is my famously bad at French channel over here. <laughs> Satin, when she determined that he was smarter than she was. In a film made when both were old toward the end of his life, Satir Satir asks de Beauvoir, the woman with whom he was sharing an astonishing life of intellectual action and accomplishment, how does it feel to have been a literary lady? Carolina Maria de Jesus wrote in her diary, everyone has an ideal in life. Mine is to be able to read. She is ambitious, but it is a strange ambition for a woman. She wants learning. She wants the pleasure of reading and writing. Men ask her to marry, but she suspects they will interfere with her reading and writing. They will resent the time she takes alone. They will resent the focus of her attention elsewhere. They will respect... They will resent her concentration, and they will resent her self-respect. They will resent her pride in herself and her pride in her unmediated relationship to a larger world of ideas, descriptions, facts. Her neighbors see her poring over books or with pen and paper in hand amidst the garbage and hunger of the favela. Her ideal makes her a pariah. Her desire to read makes her more an outcast than if she sat in the street pulling fistfuls of na putting fistfuls of nails into her mouth. Where did she get her ideal? No one offered it to her. Two thirds of the world's illiterates are women. To be fucked, to birth children, one need not know how to read. Women are for sex and reproduction, not for literature. 
I just, I, I have to, there's just so many things popping into mind. Like all the times where I was just riding the bus, reading a book, minding my own damn business. And some guy can't, comes up to me and is like, oh, I just gotta tell you all about it. Oh, you're so stuck up and think you're too good for everyone because you're reading or how could you deny yourself um, children as a woman, you know, because from a young age I knew that I wouldn't have children because I didn't want to and and it just being greeted with blanket disbelief from strange men it was none of their damn business you know it's not like they were trying to sire my children either they just couldn't believe and re re refused to accept that a woman could have a full meaningful life and not be a mother this is today, you know, this isn't the 50s. This is in the early 2000s when I was still, um, when this particular instance that I'm thinking of happened. But it, you know, it wasn't uncommon. And I suspect that for many young women it is still happening. Uh, yeah, go online and look at the Ask Aubrey Twitter account, which is its own doom scroll although to her credit she puts in timeline cleansers that are just amazing um you know and i see these men abound uh to this day but women have stories to tell <laughs> women want to know Women have questions, ideas, arguments, answers. Women have dreams of being in the world, not merely passing blood and heaving wet infants out of laboring wombs. Women dream, Florence Nightingale wrote in Cassandra, till they have no longer the strength to dream. Those dreams against which they sh so struggle, so honestly, vigorously, and conscientiously, and so in vain, yet which are their life, without which they could not have lived, those dreams go at last. Later in life, they neither desire nor dream, neither of activity, nor of love, nor of intellect. Virginia Woolf, the most splendid modern writer, told us over and over how awful it was to be a woman of creative intelligence. She told us when she loaded a large stone into her pocket and walked into the river, and she told us each time a book was published and she went mad. Don't hurt me for what I have done. I will hurt myself first. I will be incapacitated and I will suffer and I will be punished and then perhaps you needn't destroy me. Perhaps you will pity me. There is so much contempt in pity and I am so proud. Won't that be enough? She told us over and over in her prose, too, in her fiction, for she showed us ever so delicately that she would not take offense. Ever so delicately that we would not take offense. And in her essays, she piled on the charm, being polite to keep us polite. But she did write it straight out, too, though it was not published in her lifetime. And she was right. A certain attitude is required, what I call the pouring out tea attitude, the club woman. Sunday afternoon attitude. I don't know. I think that the angle is almost as important as the thing. It's going back to the how you appear versus the content of your speech. What I value is the naked contact of a mind. Often one cannot say a thing valuable about a writer except what one thinks. Now I find my angle incessantly obscured quite unconsciously, no doubt, by the desire of the editor and of the public that a woman should see things from the <laughs> charry feminine angle. My article, written from that oblique point of view, always went down. To value the naked contact of a mind is to have a virile in intelligence, not one shrouded in dresses and pretty gestures. Her work did always go down with the weight of what being female demanded. She became a master of exquisite indirection. She hid her meanings and her messages in a feminine style. She labored under that style and hid behind the ma that mask, and she was less than she could have been. She died not only from what she did dare, but also from what she did not dare. These three things 
are indissoluble link indissolubly linked literacy intellect and creative intelligence they distinguish as the cliche goes man from the animals she's uh, a bit of a human supremacist here and you know that's not my jam but this is what she wrote so I'm just gonna read it he who is denied these three is denied a fully human life and he has been robbed of the right to human dignity now change the gender I would say sex literacy intellect and creative intelligence distinguish women from the animals no woman is not distinguishable from the animals because she has been condemned by virtue of her sex class I would say caste to a life of animal functions being fucked reproducing for her the animal functions are her meaning her so-called humanity as human as she gets the highest human capacities in her because she is female to the orthodox of male culture she is animal the antithesis of soul to the liberals of male culture she is nature in discussing this so-called biological the so-called biological origins of male dominance the boys can afford to compare themselves to baboons and insects they are writing books or teaching in universities when they do it a Harvard professor does not refuse tenure because a baboon had ever been granted it. The biology of power is a game boys play. It is the male way of saying, she is more like the female baboon than she is like me. She cannot be an eminence grease at Harvard because she bleeds. We fuck her. She bears our young. We beat her up. We rape her. She is an animal. Her function is to breed. I want to see the baboon, an ant, the wasp, the goose, the Chichlid that has written War and Peace. Even more, I want to see the animal or insect or fish or fowl that has written Middle March. Literacy is a tool like fire. It is a more advanced tool than fire, and it has done a much, as much or more to change the complexion of the natural and social worlds. Literacy, like fire, is a tool that must be used by intelligence. Literacy is also a capacity. The capacity to be literate is a human capacity. The capacity exists and it can be used or it can be denied, refuted, made to atrophy. In a person socially despised, it is denied. But denial is not enough because people insist on meaning. Humankind finds meaning in experiences, events, objects, communications, relationships, feelings. Literacy functions as a part of the search for meaning it helps to make that search possible. Men can deny that women have the capacity to learn ancient Greek, but some women will learn it nevertheless. Men can deny that poor women or working class women or prostituted women have the capacity to read or write their own, in their own language, but some of these women will read or write in their own language anyway. They will risk everything to learn it. In the slaveholding South in the United States, it was forbidden by law to teach slaves to read or write, but some slave owners taught, some slaves learned, some slaves taught themselves, and some slaves taught other slaves. In Jewish law, it is forbidden to teach women Talmud, but some women learn Talmud anyway. People know that literacy brings dignity and a wider world. People are strongly motivated to experience the world they live in through language, spoken, sung, chanted, and written. One must, must punish people terribly to stop them from wanting to know what reading and writing bring, because people are curious and driven toward both experience and the conceptualization of it. The denial of literacy to any class or category of people is a denial of fundamental humanity. Humans viewed as animal, not human, are classically denied literacy. Slaves in slave-owning societies, women in women-owning societies, racially degraded groups in racist societies. The male slave is treated as a beast of burden. He cannot be allowed to read or write. The woman is treated as a beast of breeding she must not read or write. When women as a class are denied the right to read and write, those who learned are shamed by their knowledge. They are masculine, deviant. They have denied their wombs, their cunts, in their literacy, and they repudiate the definition of their kind. Certain classes of women have been granted some privilege of literacy, not rights, privileges. Courtesans of ancient Greece were educated when other women were kept ignorant, but they were not philosophers. They were whores. 
Only by accepting their function as whores could they exercise the privilege of literacy. Upper class women were tra are traditionally taught some of the skills of literacy, distinctly more circumscribed than the skills taught the males of their mating class. They can exercise the privilege of literacy if they accept their decorative function. After all, a man does not want the breeding, bleeding bitch at the dinner table or the open cunt in the parlor when, while he reads his newspaper or smokes his cigar. Language is refinement, proof that he is human, not she. The increase in illiteracy among the urban poor in the United States is constant, with a new rise in overt racism and contempt for the poor. The illiteracy is programmed into the system. An intelligent child can go to school and not be taught how to read or write. When the educational system abandons reading and writing for particular subgroups, it abandons human dignity for those groups. It becomes strictly custodial, keeping the animals penned in, and it does not bring human life to human beings. Cross-culturally, girls and women are the illiterates, with two-thirds of the world's illiterates women and the rate rising steadily. Girls need husbands, not books. Girls need houses or shacks to keep clean, or street corners to stand on, not a wide world in which to roam. Refusal to give the tool of literacy is a refusal to give access to the world. If she can make her own fire, read a book herself, write a letter, or record or a record of her thoughts, or an essay, or a story, it will be harder to get her to tolerate the unwanted fuck, to bear the unwanted children, to see him as life, and life through him. She might get ideas, but even worse, she might know the value of the ideas she gets. She must not know that ideas have value, only that being fucked and reproducing are her value. It has been hard in the United States to get women educated. There are still many kinds of education off limits to women. In England, it was hard for Virginia Woolf to use a university library. Simple literacy is the first step, and as Abby Kelly told a women's rights convention in 1850, sisters, bloody feet had worn smooth the path by which you came here. Access to the whole language has been denied women. We are only supposed to use the ladylike parts of it. Alice James noted in her diary that it is an immense loss to have all robust and sustaining expletives refined away from one. So true. It is in the actual exercise of literacy as a tool that the capacity that women face ah, ah, blah, blah, blah. it is in the actual exercise of literacy as a tool and as a capacity that women face punishment, ostracization, exile, recrimination, and most virulent contempt. To read and be feminine simultaneously, she reads gothic romances, not medical textbooks, cookbooks, not case law, mystery stories, not molecular biology. The language of mathematics is not a feminine language. She may learn astrology, not astronomy. She may teach grammar, not invent style or originate ideas. She is permitted to write a little book about neurotic women, fiction or non-fiction, if the little book is trite and sentimental enough. She had better keep clear of philosophy altogether. In fiction, she had better be careful not to overstep the severe limits imposed by femininity. This then, wrote Virginia Woolf, is another incident, and quite a common incident in the career of a woman novelist. She has to say, I will wait. I will wait until men have become so civilized that they are not shocked when a woman speaks the truth about her body. The future of fiction depends very much upon what extent men can be educated to stand free speech in women. The constraint is annihilation. Language that must avoid one's own body is language that has no place in the world. But speaking the truth about a woman's body is not the simple <laughs> explication of body parts. It is instead the place of the particular body in this particular world, that particular body in this particular world. Its value, its use, its place in power, its political and economic life, its capacities both potentially and realized and habitually abused. In a sense, intellect is a combination of literacy and intelligence. Literacy disciplines intelligence, and intelligence expands the use of literacy. There is a body of knowledge that changes and increases, and also a skill in acquiring knowledge. There is a memory filled with ideas, a storehouse of what has gone before in the world. Intellect is mastery of ideas, of culture, and of products and process processes of other intellects. 
Intellect is the capacity to learn language, disciplined into learning. Intellect must be cultivated, even in men, even in the smartest. Left alone in a private world of isolation, intellect does not develop unless it has a private cultivator, a teacher, a father of intellect, for instance. But the intellect in the female must not exceed that of the teacher, or the female will be rebuked and denied. Walt Whitman wrote that a student necessarily disowns and overthrows the teacher, but the female student must always stay, stay smaller than the teacher, always meeker. Her intelligence is never supposed to become mastery. Intellect in a woman is always a sign of privilege. She has been raised up above her kind. You know, more than a woman. Oof. Usually because of the beneficence of a man who has seen fit to educate her. The insults to females of intellect are legion. So-called blue stockings are laughing stock. Women of intellect are ugly, or they would not bother to have ideas. <laughs> The pleasure of cultivating the mind is sexual perversion in the female. The works of literate men are strewn with vicious remarks against intellectual women. Intellect is a woman's, in a woman is malignant. She is not ennobled by a fine mind. She is deformed by it. The creative mind is intelligence in action in the world. The world need not be defined as rivers, mountains, and plains. The world is anywhere that thought has consequences. And I'm not sure that I agree with that. I would say that... As a species, divorcing ourselves from the world and treating ideas as um, completely separate from it and not applying to it is making the same mistake she accuses men of making here. I'm just going to move on, though. Um, up, 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 uh, in the most abstract philosophy, thought has consequences. Philosophy is part of the world, sometimes its own self-contained world. Thinking is action, so are writing, composing, painting. Creative intelligence can be used in the material world to make products of itself, but there is more to creative intelligence than what it produces. Creative intelligence is searching intelligence. It demands to know the world demands its right to consequence. It is not contemplative. Creative intelligence is too ambitious for that. It almost always announces itself. God, I can't help but think of, of Emily Dickinson, you know, trying to get published and, you know, I have often felt in my life that I'm at the bottom of a well. I got this from a male friend. Who gave, who gave me the gift of this phrase. Um, he was editing. I asked him to be my editor. He was my first editor. And it was on a, a computer that was unable to be hooked up to the internet because it was so old. And, and I mean, eventually crashed and took the whole book with it. I had to retype the thing. Um, I remember him saying to me, you know, he was round and third on it. I feel like it's at the bottom of a well, you know, and there was no way to get it out um, because all the all the technology that could have gotten it out had gone extinct. I, I mean, I mean, I remember having going to Radio Shack and get one of those floppy A drives that um, has the cord on it that you can stick into a, a computer to try to get some information out of this also, you know, because it was just dealing with kickdowns from teachers who were like you need to get your stuff out and women teachers and and this was all that they had to offer which meant so much but it, it you know it wasn't enough to get me out of the bottom of a well and you know how how frustrated um dickinson must have felt being so prolific you know and, and having people talk over her dead body, you know, pontificating about what she thought, how she felt. Fucking no. You don't know. You know, nobody asked her. And, um, oh god, the epic injustice of that. And how, you know, she just had to live with it and die with it. Alone. Yeah. 
It announces itself. It may commit itself to the pure search for knowledge or truth, but almost always it wants recognition, influence, or power. It is an accomplishing intelligence. It is not satisfied by recognition of the personality that carries it. It wants respect in its own right, respect for itself. Sometimes this respect can be shown toward its product. Sometimes when the intelligence exercises itself in the more ephemeral, ephemeral realm of pure talk or mundane action, Respect for creative intelligence must be shown through respect for the person manifesting it. That old ad hominem attack. Women are consistently and systematically denied the respect creative intelligence requires to be sustained. Painfully denied it. Cruelly denied it. Sadistically denied it. Women are not supposed to have creative intelligence. But when they do, they are supposed to renounce it. If they want the love of men, without which they are not really women, they had better not hold on to an intelligence that searches and that is action in the world. Thought has consequences that is inimical to fettered femininity. Creative intelligence is not animal. Being fucked and reproducing will not satisfy it, ever. And creative intelligence is not decorative. It is never merely ornamental as, for instance, upper-class women, however edu well-educated, must be. To stay a woman in the male supremacist meaning of that word, women must renounce creative intelligence. Not just verbally renounce it, though women do that all the time, but snuff it out in themselves at worst. Keep it timid and restrained at best. The price for exercising creative intelligence for those born female is unspeakable suffering. She knows about this. Um, I, you know, I was gonna say, I didn't know that radical feminism existed in the world until I was 33, 34, or something like that. I, it, was, it would have been uh, 2016, I heard, and I came across it totally by accident. I, I saw this thing that Julie Bindle did on some sort of mainstream media thing, and I thought she was being so mean-spirited, and I thought, you know, I should follow up on this, because I didn't know that what what she was talking about was a thing. I just, it, it hadn't come around on the guitar, so I didn't know. So I thought, oh, I should find out more about this. Because I thought she was being just such a blue meanie. And the more I learned about her argument, I was like, no, she's right. And um, so then I, I started finding more radical feminists, and it was Chris Hedges that was doing an interview with um, Lee Lakeman and Alice Lee, and he mentioned Andrea Dworkin. And that's the first time in my little life, at the tender age of 33, 34, somewhere around there, that I heard the name Andrea Dworkin. And I thought, oh, I gotta find out who this woman is. And so sometime between 2016 and 2018, I just unhinged my jaw and <laughs> devoured all that I could find about radical feminists by the ones who were still alive and, and, and pushing it out into the world and um, it must have been somewhere in 2017 that I I made my first purchase off Amazon because I couldn't find Andrea Dworkin's books anywhere else and that, that, oh my god, that said a lot. I went down to my local bookstore and I was like, hey, you have know, a women's study section? And they were like, oh yeah, gender studies. <laughs> so I was like, okay, whatever, I'll just go in there and see what they got. And they had nothing by Andrea Dworkin at all. They were only able to order even two books of all the books that she published in the world. And I was like, well, that's not gonna be enough. You know, and if it wasn't already obvious, I'm not a rich man. Uh, so I was rubbing my pennies together and I saved up all my rub pennies to go and buy all of Andrea Dworkin's books that I could afford and I couldn't afford Child. I think that was the only one that I, I still haven't been able to get because it's like $200 when I checked. It's like, well, uh, maybe next life. But, um, but I just absolutely devoured her. Um, I probably read all... I. I, I didn't read her novels at this time, but all of her nonfiction, including In Harm's Way, I probably read within, I don't know, three or four months, and I remember the first time I heard her speak, you know, just got so used to having to salt everyone, 
you know, and, and, you know, I just figured that was just part of life, you know, everybody's got their worldview, their perspective, and you just, you know, accept that they have their funnel that they see through, and you have this other experience, and so you take what you need, and you leave the rest behind, and you try to see where they're coming from and why. And her, the first speech that I heard her give, I mean, I cried. It was the first time I had heard anyone speak in my life where I didn't have to salt what she was saying. She was just saying things that were true, that made sense, that I absolutely could back up with my own experience. And I was so relieved. <laughs> I was like, still, it still gets me verklempt to this day. I was so relieved to know that there was at least one other person in the world who got it. You know, I had to come to a lot of the same conclusions that radical feminists came to all by my lonesome. I'll get to that in another video, but I mean, it was a drag and it was, it made me a pariah. I was absolutely ostracized, it, you know, coming to all these conclusions at 25. You can imagine a 25 year old's friend base is not ready for critique of porn and prostitution, you know, at all. When I wrote Bitch, the poem, which is on my channel, people just hugged the walls to get away from me. I mean, I, I lost everyone and it was worth it. But it was hard and you know, the more I talked the less I felt understood the more I knew how misunderstood I had been the entire time and how little curiosity people had about not just women but as me as a person as a distinct person <laughs> so affronted by that and so bewilderingly alone and finding her was such a gift okay. that was a tangent <laughs> hardly digression but um, that that isolation is no joke um, No joke at all. <sighs> Must not exceed that of the teacher. The teacher, the female student, may say smaller, always meeker. Sign of privilege. You know, and I must say, literacy has been a privilege to me. I remember seeing Precious and being like, damn, literacy has kept my ass alive. And I, I can never thank my teachers enough. You know, I'll forever be in debt to my teachers for teaching me the value of books, to love books to seek books, to never stop reading, never stop learning, never stop trying. I just wish they had given me her. I wish they had had her to give me, because if they did, I know they would have. <sighs> Action in the world, creative intelligence. <laughs> uh, not satisfied. Tell me about it. Yeah, she suffered greatly for her refusal to repudiate her own intelligence. She never in her life stopped suffering for that, even when she did get a claim, even when she did get, you know, a platform to speak. It was usually used to punish her for having it. Um, so I really can't thank my... my teachers enough or whoever was running that channel baby rad fam that got kicked off of YouTube thank you um, you know there was some mean-spirited stuff on there it wasn't all um, good argument you know it wasn't all logos but there was there was enough that I, I learned and grew my life was enriched um, not just verbally renounce it, the women do that all the time, but snuff it out in themselves at worst. Keep it timid and restrained at best. The price for exercising creative intelligence for those born female is unspeakable suffering. All things on earth have their price, wrote Olive Schreiner. And for truth, we pay the dearest. We barter it for love and sympathy. The road to honor is paved with thorns. But on that path to truth, at every step, you set your foot down on your heart. 
truth is the goal of creative intelligence. Whatever its kind and path, tangling with the wor world is tangling with the problem of truth. One confronts the muck of the world, but one search is for the truth. Like Carpatia said, God bless her. Goddess bless her. The particular truth or the ultimate character of the truth one finds is not the issue. The intrusion of an intel intelligent, creative self into the world to find the truth is the issue. There is nothing here for women except intimidation and contempt. The isolation in private a woman may have in isolation, in private, a woman may have the pleasure have pleasure from the exercise of creative intelligence, however restrained she is in the exercise of it. But that intelligence will have to be turned against herself because there is no further complex human world in which it can be used and developed. Whatever of it leaks out will entitle all and sundry to criticize her womanhood, which is the sole identity available to her. Her womanhood is de deficient because her intelligence is virile. Women have passion, intellect, moral activity, Florence Nightingale asked. Why women have passion, intellect, moral activity, Florence Nightingale asked in the 1852, in 1852. And a place in society where no one of these can, three can be exercised. When she referenced, when she referred to moral activity, she did not mean moralism. She meant moral intelligence. Moralism is the set of rules learned by rote that keeps women locked in so that intelligence can never meet the world head on. Moralism is a defense against experiencing the world. Moralism is a moral sphere designated to women who are supposed to learn the rules of their own proper circumscribed behavior by rote. Moral intelligence is active. It can be developed and refined by being used in the realm of real and direct experience. Moral activity is the use of that intelligence, the exercise of moral discernment. Moralism is passive. It accepts the version of the world as it has been taught and shudders at the threat of direct experience. Moral intelligence is characterized by activity, movement through ideas and history. It takes on the world and insists on participating in the great and terrifying issues of right and wrong, tenderness and cruelty. Moral intelligence constructs values. And because those values are exercised in the real world, they have consequences. There is no moral intelligence that does not have real consequ consequences in the world, or that is simply impassively received, or that can live in a vacuum in which there is no action. Moral intelligence cannot be expressed only through love, or only through sex, or only through domesticity, or only through ornamentation, or only through obedience. Moral intelligence cannot be expressed only through being fucked or reproducing. Moral intelligence must act in a public world, not a private, refined, rarefied relationship with one other person to the exclusion of the rest of the world. Here, I, I, I do want to reference something that Michael Parenti said when he talked about um, male terrorism in his lecture on male terrorism. And he was talking about how um, many of the women in his experience would prefer not to work outside the household. They would be very happy to be able to stay at home, though modern capitalism often prevents women from being able to do that because two incomes are required just to stay afloat um, but because the world is so hostile to women outside the home that having a buffer does benefit women in many ways many women in many ways although you know who protects you from the protector is the thing that always comes up and I don't know if it's in this chapter that she says that it's the choice between having to deal with one man or with a million strangers. And that struggle's real, man. <laughs> I gotta say, that is that's a you know I begrudge no one their choice there. You make whatever choice you want to make there. That's <laughs> it's rough out there. You know, and for women who are protected by money or position, good for you, you know, but not all women are, so we're still here. Oh, there goes the light. Oh, well, sallying forth. Um... Uh, 
on a private, rarefied relationship with one other person to the exclusion of the rest of the world. Moral intelligence demands a nearly endless exercise of the ability to make decisions, significant decisions, decisions inside history, not peripheral to it, decisions about the meaning of life, decisions that arise from an acute awareness of one's own mortality, decisions on which one can honestly and willfully stake one's life. Moral intelligence is not the stuff of which cunts are made. Moralism is the cunt's effort to find some basis for self-respect, a pitiful gesture toward being a human at which men laugh and for which women pity other women. There is also possibly sexual intelligence, a human capacity for discerning, manifesting, and constructing sexual integrity. Sexual intelligence could not be measured in numbers of orgasms, erections, or partners, nor could it show itself by posing painted clitoral lips in front of a camera, nor could one measure it by the number of children born, nor would it manifest as addiction. Sexual intelligence, like any other kind of intelligence, would be active and dynamic. It would need the real world, the direct experience of it. It would pose not buttocks but questions, answers, theories, ideas in the form of desire, or act, or art, or articulation. It would be in the body, but it could never be an imprisoned, isolated body, a body denied access to the world. It would not be mechanical, nor could it stand to be viewed as inert and stupid, nor could it be exploited by another without diminishing in vigor. And being sold on the marketplace as a commodity would necessarily be anathema to it, a direct affront to its intrinsic need to confront the world in self-defined, self-determining terms. Sexual intelligence would probably be more like moral intelligence than like anything else. A point that women for centuries have been trying to make. But since no intelligence in, woman, in women is respected, and since she is condemned to moralism because she is defined as being incapable of moral intelligence, and since she is defined as a sexual thing to be used, the meaning of women in likening moral and sexual intelligence is not understood. Sexual intelligence asserts itself through sexual integrity, a dimension of values and actions forbidden to women. Sexual intelligence would have to be rooted first and foremost in the honest possession of one's own body. And women exist to be possessed by others, namely men. The possession of one's own body would have to be absolute and entirely realized for the intelligence to thrive in the world of action. Sexual intelligence, like moral intelligence, would have to confront the great issues of cruelty and tenderness. But where moral intelligence must tangle with questions of right and wrong, sexual intelligence would have to tangle with questions of dominance and submission. One preordained to be fucked has no need to exercise sexual intelligence, no opportunity to exercise it, no argument that justifies exercising it. To keep women sexually acquiescent, the capacity for sexual intelligence must be prohibited to her. And it is. Her clitoris is denied. Her capacity for pleasure is distorted and defamed. Her erotic values are slandered and insulted. Her desire to value her body as her own is paralyzed and maimed. She is turned into an occasion for male pleasure, an object for male desire, a thing to be used, and any willful expression of her sexuality in the world, unmediated by men or male values, is punished. I, <laughs> I was telling a friend, it's like, um, it's like rolling the dice, you know, you never know when you're gonna get snake eyes, and um, men don't really have an equivalent experience of that. Um, not even in prison, not even if they're gay, not even if they're children. Do they have that experience of meeting someone and risking someone and having them absolutely brutalize and humiliate you and get off on it and enjoy it sexually and for you to just be totally bewildered and kind of grateful that you didn't get axe murdered in the woods. Um, that's shitty. <laughs> it's just so bad. <laughs> oh my goodness. Um, a thing to be used, willful expression of her sexuality in the world, values is punished, she's used. Okay. 
She's turned into, into an occasion for male pleasure, an object of male desire, a thing to be used, and any willful expression of her sexuality in the world, unmediated by men or male values, is punished. She is used as a slut or as a lady. But sexual intelligence cannot manifest in, human, in a human being whose predestined purpose is to be exploited through sex, by sex, in sex, as sex. Sexual intelligence constructs its own use. It begins with a whole body, not one that has already been cut into parts and fetishized. It begins with a self-respecting body, not one that is characterized by class as dirty, wanton, and slavish. It acts in the world, a world it enters on its own, with freedom as well as with passion. Sexual intelligence cannot live behind locked doors any more than any other kind of intelligence can. Sexual intelligence cannot exist defensively, keeping out rape. Sexual intelligence cannot be decorative or pretty or coy or timid, nor can it lie on a diet of contempt, live on a diet of contempt and abuse and hatred of its human form. Sexual intelligence is not animal, it is human, it has values, it sets limits that are meaningful to the whole person and personality which must live in history and in the world. Women have found the development and exercise of sexual intelligence more difficult than any other kind. Women have learned to read. Women have acquired intellect. Women have had so much creative intelligence that even despisal and isolation and punishment have not been able to squeeze it out of them. Women have struggled for moral intelligence that by its very existence repudiates moralism. But sexual intelligence is cut off at its roots because the woman's body is not her own. The incestuous use of a girl murders it. The sexual intimidation, and it, you know, she talks about this in absolute terms, like, oh, that's it for you. And I don't feel that way. I think that the human, um, that not just humans, that life is so much more resilient than that, that um, one who completely shuts down after injury um, has, has given more power to their abuser than, um, their abuser initially took, in my humble opinion. Um, sexual intelligence. Um, women have found the development and exercise of. Okay, wait, oh my goodness. I just mark it when I uh, pop off. Otherwise, I'm just going to have to. Search for it all over again. Um, 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 the sexual intimidation or violation of a girl murders it. The enforced chastity of a girl murders it. The separation of a girl from girl murders it. The turning over of a girl to a man as wife murders it. The selling of a girl into prostitution murders it. The use of a woman as wife murders it. The use of a woman as a sexual thing murders it. The selling of a woman as a sexual commodity, not just on the street, but in media, murders it. The economic value given to a woman's body, whether high or low, murders it. The keeping of a woman as a toy or ornament or a domesticated cunt murders it. They need to be a mother so that one is not perceived as a whore. The need to be a mother so that one is not perceived as a whore murders it. The requirement that one bear babies murder it murders it. The fact that the sexuality of the female is predetermined and that she is forced to be what men say she is murders sexual intelligence. There is nothing for her to discern or construct. There is nothing for her to find out except what men will do to her and what she will have to pay if she resists or gives in. She lives in a private world. Even a street corner is a private world of sexual usage, not a public world of honest confrontation. In, and her private world of sexual usage has narrow boundaries and a host of givens. No intelligence, ah, wait. No intelligence can function in a world that consists fundamentally of two rules that by their very nature prohibit the invention of values, identity, will, desire, be fucked, reproduce. Men have constructed female sexuality and in doing so have annihilated the chance for sexual intelligence in women. Sexual intelligence cannot live in the shallow, predestined sexuality men have counterfeited for women. Another quote, this one's by Victoria Woodhill from 1874. I respect and honor the needy woman who, to procure, procure food for herself and child, sells her body to some stranger for the necessary money. But for that legal virtue, which she sells herself for a lifetime for a home, 
with an ab abhorrence of the purchaser, and which at the same time says to the former, I am holier than thou, I have only the supremest contempt. The argument between wives and whores is an old one, each one thinking that whatever she is, at least she is not the other, and there is no doubt that the wife envies the whore, or Maribel Morgan's ladies would not be wrapping themselves in saran wrap or wearing black boots with na lacy neon nighties, and that the whore envies the do domesticity of the wife, especially her physical sheltering and her relative sexual privacy, both categories of women, specious as the categories finally turn out to be, need what men have to give. They need the material solicitude of men, not their cocks, but their money. The cock is the inevitable precondition. Without it, there is no man, no money, no shelter, no protection. With it, there may not be much, but women prefer men to silence, exile, to being pariahs, to being lone refugees, to being outcasts, defenseless. Victoria Woodhill, the first woman stockbroker on Wall Street, the first woman to run for president of the United States, 1870, the publisher of the first translation of the Communist Manifesto in the United States, 1871, the first person ever arrested under the notoriously repressive Comstock Law, 1872, crusaded against the marital dependency of women on men because she knew that anyone who bartered her body bartered he her human dignity. She hated the hypocrisy of married women. She hated the condition of prostitution, which degraded both wives and whores, and especially she hated the men who profited sexually and economically from marriage. It's a sharp trick played by men upon women, by which they acquire the legal right to debauch them without cost, and to make it unnecessary for them to visit professional prostitutes whose sexual services can only be obtained for money. Now isn't this true? Men know it is. Woodhill did not romanticize prostitution. She did not adv advocate it as freedom from marriage, or freedom in itself, or sexual freedom. Prostitution, she made clear, was for money, not for fun. It was survival, not pleasure. Woodhill's passion was sexual freedom, and she knew that prostitution and rape of women were antithetical to it. She was a mass organizer, and the masses of women were married, sexually subordinate to men, in marriage. At the time when feminists did not analyze sex directly or articulate ideas explicitly antagonistic to, se to sex as practiced, Woodhill exposed marital rape and compulsory intercourse as the purpose, meaning, and method of marriage. Of all the horrid brutalities of this age, I know none so horrid as that, that are those that are sanctioned and defended by marriage. Night after night there are thousands of rapes committed, under cover of this accursed license, and millions, yes I say it boldly, knowing where, whereof I speak, millions of poor, heartbroken, suffering wives are compelled to minister to the lechery of insatiable husbands, whose every instinct of body and sentiment of soul re revolts in loathing and disgust. All married persons know this is truth, although they may feign to, shout, to shut their eyes and ears to the horrid thing and pretend to believe it is not. The world has got to be startled from this pretense into realizing that there is nothing, el nothing else now existing among pretendedly enlightened nations except marriage that invests men with the right to debauch women sexually against their wills. Yet marriage is held to be synonymous with morality. I say, eternal damnation sink such morality. Wives were the majority, whores the minority, prostitution the condition of each, rape the underbelly of prostitution. Woodhill's aggressive repudiation of the good, bad woman, the good woman, bad woman syndrome, with which women, then as now, were so very comfortable, her relentless attacks on the hypocrisy of the good woman, and her rude refusal to call the sufferance of rape virtue, had one purpose, to unite women in common perception of their common condition. And I, I have to interject here, you know, I never prostituted myself. I was never prostituted by anyone else. And you know, when I was coming up in the world, my my um, my last guardian, when I was still a minor, when I first came into her care, she said to me, you know, when I met you, you seemed like the kind of person who would strip for money. And now, you know, under my tutelage and, and influence, 
I don't, you seem like the person who, the kind of person who wouldn't, you know, you see, like, I've, I've taught you to know better than doing that. And that's the kind of feminism that I came up in, you know, where we we're taking back the C word and, um, you know, it was not a big deal to be gay. I mean, I was harassed for kissing my girlfriend in high school and, you know, it's not like I never faced violence. Um, for having special lady friends, um, but it was it was a different time, and um, and coming up with that that third wave feminist approach, uh, which my last guardian didn't exactly have, but didn't exactly not have. You know, she was kind of cusping between second wave and third wave, although she probably was aware of neither. Um, you know, she really put it in me that, that what Andrea would call sexual intelligence was something that was important and, um, and that I should seek out and forge for myself, but that it was also this, um, that it was a matter of, of character. Like you had, you had failing character if you were in the sex industry and, um, for a long time, I believed that, and I worked very hard. I worked very hard to keep from having to sell my body. But there were and remain plenty of women for whom that was not an option. Um, either they weren't given a choice, or there was no way that they could have worked hard enough. And you know, in, in all brutal honesty, I wouldn't have been able to work hard enough to keep from having to be a part of that industry if there weren't men around me. It was the, <laughs> it, you know, it was either um, a, a romantic partnership or um, or the government, you know, that, that kept me from having to do that. And, um, I mean, how many, how many women are stuck in these, in, in horrible, horrible relationships because they can't afford to live alone? Countless, countless women, you know, and, and there are plenty of women who would say, oh, well, that's not exactly prostitution. That's just like a compromise. And it's like, well, that's a fine line, you know, there's a, there's precious little difference. And, you know, I was blessed with, with partners who were careful of that and who not, not just didn't want to be used for money, which is like the common, you know, rally and cry among men's rights activists, but actually cared about me as a person and, um, and didn't want to be that guy, you know, so it was very lucky in that way. But God, there are some real brutes out there and not every woman is as lucky. It's not their moral failing, you know? It's women in the industry who um, helped me get out of bad relationships more often than not. And I, I put that in her so you could, I'm not gonna reread that poem and I'm not gonna go into all those stories, but I wrote a sh short essay on it, very, very short. And it's, it's in Ursula in the video, I'll put a link. If you want to watch me cry and drink water for an hour, that's an option. <laughs> but yeah, this this is uh, I I think I learned so much from that last guardian, and she enriched my life in so many ways. I will forever be in her debt. But that was cruel to say to a child, and it was inaccurate. That false dichotomy was an allowance that she could have because she had money, you know. Um, and when she kicked my ass out, I was poor, so you know that stung extra hard. Cause man, I worked like hell. Um, Why is the majority? Who is the minority? Okay. 
my mom, um, just selling themselves. Virtue had one purpose with her hypocrisy of the good woman. Um, so, uh, whew. Oh, the feelings. Big, big feelings. Um, her relentless attacks on the hypocrisy of the good woman and her rude refusal to call the sufferance of rape virtue had one purpose, to unite women in a common perception of their common condition. Selling themselves was women's desperate, necessary, unforgivable crime. Not acknowledging the sale divided women and obscured women Uh, not acknowledging this sale divided women and obscured how and why women were used sexually by men. Marriage, women's only refuge, was the place of mass rape. Woodhull pro proclaimed herself a free lover, by which she meant that she could not be bought, not in marriage, not in prostitution, as commonly understood. And I must say, you know, I was right there with her, especially as a young woman, and, um... It took being hospitalized for me to understand the value of marriage, and I see very little value outside of it. You know, if you watch These Walls Could Talk too, you don't have to get past that first little triad of sections to understand the value of marriage. When you tie yourself to someone for life, you build a life together, and for that life to be rent from you because you're not the, their sister or their parent or you know, the name, the child, or the named inheritor, that, that's, that's horrible. So, um, I can absolutely see the value of having, having access to your partner who's in the hospital, who needs you, um, who needs to advocate, who you need to advocate for you, or being the reciprocant of the, the benefits of the life that you've built together, you know, if you're together until death. So I'm not throwing baby out with the bathwater here, but her argument stands. Um, in telling married women that they had indeed sold their sex for money, she was telling them that they had bartered away more than the prostitute ever could. All privacy, all economic independence, all legal individuality, every shred of control over their bodies in sex and in reproduction both. And thank goodness those laws have changed a little bit not enough especially for poor women who have no path to recourse you know I was saying just the other day to my husband um, about uh, having you know raises promised and then denied paycheck after paycheck or having your hours shaved like you do in um, low paying jobs you know you work 40 hours and they pay you for 36 which happens a lot what are you supposed to do you know, if you're ragamuffin dragging ass into some law firm, they're going to laugh you right out of there. They're going to be like, oh, we don't do pro bono work and you can't retain us. You, Who do you go to? You know, and you don't even know where to go the, because poverty shrinks your world. You, you have access to very little. And that's hard for people who have access to understand. <laughs> they're like, oh, why didn't you just go down to the such and such? Well, I didn't know that was an option. You know, <laughs> And that, that ignorance is enforced. So. Oh, I need a shake and stick for these readings. <clears throat> Woodhull herself was widely regarded as a whore because she proclaimed herself sexually determining, sexually active. She spit in the face of the sexual double standard. I have experienced that too. <laughs> Called a prostitute by a man at a public meeting, Woodhull responded, A man questioning my virtue. Have I any right as a woman to answer him? I hurl the intention back in your face, sir, and stand boldly before you in this convention and declare that I have never had sexual intercourse with any man of whom I am ashamed to stand side by side with before the world with the act. I am not ashamed of any act in my life. At the time, it was the best I knew. Nor am I ashamed of any desire that has been gratified, nor of any passion alluded to. Every one of them are part of my life's own, my own soul's life, for which, thank God, I am not accountable to you. And I would like to say that I feel the same way. Um, you know, and if I leaned hard in on the, at the time, it was the best I knew, I probably could. 
but there are men so vile out there that I do have regret. You know, there are there are a couple times where it's like, you know, and I'm not talking about the rapes. I'm not talking about uh, bent power dynamics or being trapped in a bad situation or, you know, all the the, the horrible provable things. I'm talking about situations that I walked into with somebody that I thought I wanted who left me so repulsed that I had real regret and yeah walking in it was the best that I knew but walking out I was like and this is a whole other world of thing like there are two men in particular that I'm thinking of who I had about like a three month relationship with if you could call it that and and this is the thing that I, I have heard very few women talk about but this is a thing that needs to be talked about this is a real thing and I I, I mean how do you even explain it there are some people who would call it like trauma bonding which I don't believe in or Stockholm Syndrome which I also don't believe in I think you know People, people do what they have to do to survive. Let's just get that out of the way. And sometimes people can see threads of value or goodness in people that the outside world can't appreciate. They're like, what are, you, what are you after here? I can't see it. But, you know, it's not yours. Whatever. It's different. That's different than what this was. What this was, what happened, was... I had a, a distance infatuation with somebody and then a long time would go by different lengths of time in both cases but it wasn't like oh the next day or the next month or week or whatever there was some time in between the initial point of contact and the like flit of infatuation that little peak of interest and then the first sexual encounter and the first sexual encounter was a violent, degrading act of abuse. And it didn't end. I wouldn't allow myself to believe that it, that, that it was what had happened. I just couldn't. Part of it was, uh, I think, like a sunken cost fallacy. Like I, I wanted so much for this thing to be good and for my initial ideas about this person to be true and I had plenty of experience, as I'm sure many women have, of, of training good lovers. You know, especially as a young person dealing with other young people, especially as a woman. Sometimes you have to teach your partner how to do it. You know, they don't know what they're doing, and so you have to go and be like, okay, here's what you do. And, and so I had had experience with making good lovers. I have left many good lovers in this world. Ladies, you're welcome. Um, but these guys were fucking uncurable. They were vile. And I just, I, I thought, okay, well, I can fix this. You know, I've done impossible things. I can, I can make it right. And I couldn't, I couldn't. And after about three months, I was like, wow, it just like clicked. These men are fucking awful. They're awful. They're vile. I can't believe I ever went back. Why did I ever go back? You know, and I was like, God, it's so on me, you know, because I, I'd led them to believe that this was okay with my, um, recurring presence and, and it just, it so disgusted me and I felt real regret, like, to this day, I like, you know, I feel, ugh, ugh, just, And this, you know, that's what I'm talking about with rolling the dice and, and sexual intelligence. You know, how do you know without really good sex and really bad sex? And I'm not talking about like, <laughs> I thought it was really, really awful way to throw women under the bus when Jermaine Greer said a lot of women uh, think that bad sex is rape. Like what they're calling rape is really just bad sex. And I'm telling you, I've had both. And there's a difference. Um, bad sex is uh, an ignorant man, 
you know. And sexual abuse is something else. It's different. And you know, when you roll snake eyes, man, it, it does change things. Um, it it's it's rattling. And I I remember being so grateful for the good men in my life, like m so much more grateful for the good men in my life after those experiences and and how how it clouded my critique of those men, you know, my worthy critique, like these these men were good people, but there were critiques to be made and they were so overshadowed by the horror. It's like, oh God, I forget what, what television commenter it was who's like, oh, we should, you know, be so grateful for these shitty American men because at least they're not the Taliban. I mean, it was like at that level, you know, and, and, and I, I can't help but feel like maybe that's the purpose of this um, grotesque, you know, wave of, of pornography and, and pro-sex work stuff. It's, it's to make women grateful for every little scrap of decency that a man will deign to throw at you. And I mean, that, that is, of course, the radical feminist analysis, is that this isn't an accident. These men know exactly what they're doing. They do it on purpose. They do it as a group. It is organized. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, okay. Uh, thank God I'm not accountable to you. <laughs> Few feminists appreciated her. Elizabeth uh, Candy Stan Stanton was an exception, as usual, because she confronted women with her own sexual vitality, the political meaning of sex, and the sexual and economic appropriation of women's bodies by men, the usurpation of female desire by men for the purposes of their own illegitimate power. She was direct and impassioned, and she made women remember that they had been raped in focusing on the apparent and actual sexual worth of wives and whores, she made the basic claim of radical feminism. All freedom, including sexual freedom, begins with an absolute right to one's own body, physical self-possession. She knew, too, in practical as well as political terms, that forced sex in marriage led to forced pregnancy in marriage. I protest against this form of slavery. I protest against the custom which compels women to give the control of their material functions over to anybody. Victoria Woodhull exercised sexual intelligence in public discourse, ideas, and activism. She is one of the few women to have done so. This effort required all the other kinds of intelligences that distinguish humans from animals. Literacy, intellect, creative intelligence, moral intelligence. Some consequences of sexual intelligence became clear in Woodhull's exercise of it. She made the women she addressed in person and in print face the sexual and economic system built on their bodies. She was one of the great philosophers of and agitators for sexual freedom, but not as men understand it, because she abhorred rape and prostitution, and knew them when she saw them inside marriage or outside it, and would not accept or condone the violence against women implicit in them. I make the claim boldly, she dared to say, that from the very moment a woman is em emancipated from the necessity of yielding the control of her sexual organs to a man to ensure home, food, and clothing, the doom of sexual demoralization will be sealed. Since women experience sexual demoralization most abjectly in sexual intercourse, Woodhull did not shy away from the inevitable conclusion. From that moment, there will be no intercourse except such as, desire as is desired by women. It will be a complete revolution in sexual matters. Intercourse not willed and initiated by the women is rape, in Woodhull's analysis. She anticipated current feminine critiques of intercourse, modest and rare as they are, by a century. As if to celebrate the centennial of Woodhull's repudiation of male supremacist sexual intercourse, Robin Morgan in 1974 transformed Woodhull's insight into a firm principle. I claim that rape exists any time sexual intercourse occurs when it has not been initiated by the woman out of her own genuine affection and desire. This shocks, bewilders. Who can imagine it? What can it mean? Now as then, there is one woman speaking, not a movement. 
Woodhull was not taken seriously as a thinker, writer, publisher, journalist, active, activist, pioneer by those who followed her, not by historians, teachers, intellectuals, revolutionaries, reformers, not by the lovers or rapists, not by the women. Had she been part of the cultural dialogue on sexual issues, the whole subsequent development of movements for sexual freedom would have been different in character because she hated rape and prostitution and understood them as violations of sexual freedom, which male liber <laughs> liberationists did not. But then, this is why she was excluded. The men wanted the rape and prostitution. She threatened not only those sacred institutions, but the male hallucinations that prettify those institutions. The happy visions of happy women, caged, domesticated, or wanton, numb to rape, numb to being bought and sold. Her sexual intelligence was despised, and then ignored, because of what it revealed. He who hates the truth hates the intelligence that brings it. Sexual intelligence in women, the rarest intelligence in male supremacist world, is necessarily a revolutionary intelligence. The opposite of the pornographic, which simply reiterates the world as it is for women. The opposite of the will to be used. The opposite of masochism, of self-hatred, the opposite of good woman, bad woman, both. It is not in being a whore that a woman becomes an outlaw in this man's world. It is in the possession of herself, the ownership and effective control of her own body, her separateness and distinctness, the integrity of her body as hers, not his. Prostitution may be against the written law, but no prostitute has defied the prerogatives or power of men as a class through prostitution. No prostitute provides any model for freedom. And she uses this over and over again. That, um, prostitute is a... Identifier of women. But I, I have to be with uh, Catherine McKinnon on this one. That, um, that by the nature of itself says that that is what this woman is and her essence of being a prostitute as opposed to defining the world around her doing to her what is done to her so i would say you know a prostituted person because you i mean you can't pay yourself for this <laughs> you know these are um externalities of male supremacists landing on the heads of women or their cons as it were so just throwing that out there. Um, no prostitute has defied the prerogatives or power of men as a class through prostitution. No prostitute provides any model of freedom or action in a world of freedom that can be used with intelligence and integrity by a woman, i.e. the sex work model. The model exists to entice counterfeit female sexual revolutionaries, gullible liberated girls, to serve the men who enjoy them. The prostitute is no honest woman. She manipulates as the wife manipulates. So too, no honest woman can live in marriage. No woman honest in her will to be free. Marriage delivers her body to another to use, and there is no basis for self-respect in this carnal arrangement, however sanctified it may be by church and state. You know, I dream of a world in which that is not true, but it is. Um, and you're really at the mercy of the character of the man you marry in this. You know, it doesn't have to be true, but it's always a possibility. A man could always pull rank, so to say. It's always there. It never goes away. And, you know, if you're lucky, a man will never pull rank on you. A lot of women are lucky. <laughs> Wife or whore, she is defined by what men want. Sexual intelligence is stopped dead. Wife or whore, to paraphrase Thackeray, her heart is dead. Her heart was dead long before her body. She had sold it to become Sir Prit Crawley's wife. Mothers and daughters are making the same bar bargain every day in Vanity Fair. Wife or whore, both are fucked, bear children, resent, suffer, grow numb, want more. Wife or whore, both are denied a human life, forced to live a female one. Wife or whore, intelligence denied, annihilated, ridiculed, obliterated, primes her to surrender. 
to her female fate. Wife or whore, the two kinds of women whom men recognize, whom men let live. Wife or whore, battered, raped, prostituted, men desire her. Wife or whore, the whore comes in from the cold to become the wife if she can. The wife thrown out into the cold becomes the whore if she must. At the mercy of the man, is there any way out of the home that does not lead inevitably and horribly to the street corner? This is the question right-wing women face. This is the question all women face. But right-wing women know it. And in transit, home or street, street to home, is there any place, reason or chance for female intelligence that is not simply looking for the best buyer? The quote from Jenny P. De Hercourt, A Woman's Philosophy of Women, or Women a Franchise, from 1864. So, ladies, ye who prefer, prefer labor to prostitution, who pass days and nights in providing for the wants of your family, it is understood, of course, that you are degraded. A woman ought not to do anything. Respect and honor belongs to idleness. You, Victoria of England, Isabella of Spain, you command. Therefore, you are radically degraded. The sex labor of women, for the most part, is private. In the bedroom or secret, prostitutes may be seen, but how the Johns use them may not. Ideally, women do nothing. Women simply are women. In truth, women get used up in private or in secret being women. In the ideal conce conception of womanhood, woman does not do work that can be seen. Women only do hidden sex labor. In the real world, women who work for wages outside of sex are dangerously outside the female sphere. Women are denigrated for not being ideal, apparently idle, untouched by visible labor. Behind the smokescreen of ideal idleness, there is always women's work. Women's work first is marriage. In the morning, I'm always nervous, Carolina de Jesus wrote. I'm afraid of not getting money to buy food to eat. Senor Manuel showed up saying he wanted to marry me, but I don't want to. A man isn't going to like a woman who can't stop reading and gets out of bed to write and sleeps with paper and pencil under her pillow. That's why I prefer to live alone, for my ideals. The woman in marriage is often in marriage because her ideal is eating, not writing. Women's work, second, is prostitution. Sexual service outside of marriage for money. I'd like so much to have the illusion that I had some freedom of choice, said Jay in Kate Millett's The Prostitution Papers. Maybe it's just an illusion, but I need to think I had some freedom. Yet then I realized how much was determined in the way I got into prostitution, how determined my life had been, how fucked over I was. So I believed I'd chosen it. What's most terrifying t is to look back, to realize what I went through, and that I endured it. The women in prostitution learns, as Linda Lovelace said in Ordeal, to settle for the smallest imaginable triumphs, the absence of pain, or the momentary lessening of terror. The woman in prostitution is often in prostitution because her ideal is physical survival, surviving the pimp, surviving poverty, having nowhere to go. Women's social condition is built on a simple premise. Women can be fucked and bear babies, therefore women must be fucked and bear babies. Sometimes, especially among the sophisticated, penetrated is substituted for fucked. Women can be penetrated, therefore women must be penetrated. This logic does not apply to men. Whichever word is used, men can be fucked, therefore men must be fucked. Men can be penetrated, therefore men must be penetrated. This logic applies only to women in sex. One does not say, for instance, women have delicate hands, therefore women must be surgeons, or women have legs, therefore women must run, cl jump, climb, or women have minds, therefore women must use them. One does learn, however, that women have sex organs that must be used by men or the women are not women. They are somehow less or more, either of which is bad and thoroughly discouraged. Women are defined, valued, judged in one way only, as women, that is, with sex organs that must, must be used. Other parts of the body do not signify unless used in sex or as an indicator of sexual availability or desirability. Intelligence does not count. It has nothing to do with what a woman is. And isn't that just gender ideology in a nutshell? <laughs>
Nelly. Uh, women are born into the labor pool specific to women. The labor is sex. Intelligence does not modify, reform, or revolutionize this basic fact of life for women. Women are marked for marriage and prostitution by a wound between their legs. Acknowledge as such when men show their strange terror of women. Intelligence neither creates nor destroys this wound, nor does it change the use of the wound, the woman, the sex. Women's work is done below the waist. Intelligence is higher. Women are lower. Men are higher. It's a simple, dull scheme, but women's sex organs in and of themselves are apparently appalling enough to justify the scheme, to make it self-evidently true. The natural intelligence of women, however, expanded by what women manage to learn despite their low status, manifests in surviving, enduring, marking time, bearing pain, becoming numb, absorbing loss, especially loss of self. Women survive men's use of them, marriage, prostitution, rape. Women's intelligence expresses itself in finding ways to endure and find meaning in the unendurable, to endure being used because of one's sex. Sex with men, how can I say, lacks the personal, wrote Maurice Holder in Give Sorrow Words. Some women want to work, not sex labor, real work, work that men, those real humans, do for living wage. They want an honest wage for honest work. One of the prostitutes Kate Millett interviewed made $800 a week in her prime. With a PhD and after 10 years experience in teaching, Millett wrote, I was permitted to make only $60 a week. And I must say, um, it doesn't matter if your boss is a woman or a man. Women get paid less. Um, this is why they fill middle management with women. We'll be so grateful to make a living wage to do something they would have to pay a man twice as much to do. Women's work that is not marriage or prostitution is mostly segre segregated, always underpaid, stagnant, sex stereotyped. In the United States in 1981, women earned 56 to 59 percent of what men earned. Women are paid significantly less than men for doing comparable work. It is not easy to find comparable work. The consequences of this inequity, however the percentages read in any given year, in any given country, are not new for women. Unable to sell sex-neutral labor, labor for a living wage, women must sell sex. To subordinate women in a social order in which she must work in order to live, Jenny de Hercourt wrote, uh, French socialist Joseph Proudhorn in the mid-1800s is to desire prostitution, for disdain of the producer extends to the value of the product. The woman who cannot live by working can only do so by prostituting herself. The equal of man or a courtesan is such an alternative. Proudhorn's egalitarian vision could not be stretched to include women. He wrote to Harcourt, Harry Court, I do not admit that Whatever reparation may be due to women of joint thirds with her husband or father and her children, the most rigorous justice can never make her the equal of man. Nor do I admit that this inferiority of the female sex constitutes for it either servitude or humiliation, or the diminution of dignity, liberty, or happiness. I maintain that the contrary is true. You would. <laughs> de Herricourt's argument construct constructs the world of women. Women must work for fair wages in non-sexual labor or they must sell themselves to men. The disdain of men for women makes the work of women worth less simply because women do it. The devaluation of women's work is predetermined by the devaluation of women as a sex class. Women end up having to sell themselves because when men will not buy labor from them that is not sex labor at wages that will enable women to divest themselves of sex as a form of labor. Proudhorn's answer constructs, its, constructs the world of men, the best of all possible worlds, acknowledging that some economic discrimination against women has taken place. No justice on earth can make women equal to men because women are inferior to men, and this inferiority does not humiliate or de degrade women. Women find happiness, dignity, and liberty in this inequity precisely because they are women. That is the nature of women. Women are being treated justly, and are free when they are treated as women, that is, as the natural inferiors of men. The brave new world Proudhorn wanted was, for women, the same old world women already knew. The Harcourt recognized what Victoria Woodhill would not. 
The disdain of the producer extends to the value of the product. Work for wages outside sex labor would not effectively free women from the stigma of being female because the stigma precedes the women and predetermines the undervaluing of her work. This means that right-wing women are correct when they say they are worth more in the home than outside it. In the home, their value is recognized, and in the workplace, it is not. In marriage, sex labor is rewarded. The woman is generally given more than she herself could earn at a job. I'm looking at you, all my former bosses. I can see you. <laughs> oh my god. The argument that work outside the home makes women sexually and economically independent of men is simply untrue. Women are paid too little. And right-wing women know it. And to all the women who escaped, who live on their own, good for you. Putting that shit on the women who can't, who never could, you know, who don't have the family support to get to college who don't have the financial idiocy in modernity to make it through college, which will put you in debt forever. <laughs> you know, that's, you shouldn't talk about what you know, what you don't know. That's what I'll say. You shouldn't talk about what you don't know. That's what I have to say about that. Um, the argument that to work outside the home makes women sexually and economically independent of men is simply untrue. Women are paid too little and right-wing women know it. Feminists know that if women are paid equal wages for equal work, women will gain sexual as well as economic independence. But feminists have refused to face the fact that in woman hating in a woman hating social system women will never be paid equal wages men in all their institutions of power are sustained by the sex labor and sexual subordination of women the sex labor of women must be maintained the systematic low wages for sex neutral work effectively force women to sell sex to survive the economic system that pays women lower wages than it pays men actually punishes women for working outside marriage or prostitution, since women work hard for low wages and still must sell sex. The economic system that punishes women for working outside the bedroom by paying low wages contributes significantly to women's perception that the sexual serving of men is a necessary part of any woman's life, or how else could she live? Feminists appear to think that equal pay for equal work is a simple reform, whereas it is no reform at all. It is revolution. Feminists have refused to face the fact that equal pay for equal work is impossible as long as men rule women, and right-wing women have refused to forget it. Devaluation of women's labor outside the home pushes women back into the home and encourages women to support a system in which, as she sees it, he is paid for both of them her share of his wage being more than she could earn herself. In the workplace, sexual harassment fixes the low status of women irreversibly. Women are sex, even filing or typing, women are sex. The debilitating, insidious voice, insidious violence of sexual harassment is pervasive in the workplace. And I must say, the sexual harassment laws have not changed that. Not in my life. There are women who lean in, you know, there are women who are like, oh, I own it, you know, for foom, for foom, you know, and they're like, this is just how I make good tips. And um, I think a lot of women try to sexually intimidate men out of sexually harassing them, and a lot of times they're successful. But then there are women who are not willing to make that deal and they are punished for it. The debilitating, insidious violence of sexual harassment is pervasive in the workplace. It is part of nearly every working environment. Women shuffle, women placate, women submit, women leave. The rare, brave women fight and are tied up in the courts, often without jobs, for years. There is also rape in the workplace. Where is the place for intelligence? For literacy? Oh, hi, baby. Hi. Oh, my girl. Whoop. 
Where is the place for intelligence, for literacy, intellect, creativity, moral discernment? Where in this world in which women live, circumscribed by the uses to which men put women's sexual organs, is the cultivation of skills, the cultivation of gifts, the cultivation of dreams, the cultivation of ambition? Of what use is human intelligence to a woman? Of course, wrote Virginia Woolf, the learned women were very ugly, but then they were very poor. She would like to feed the chuffy for the team on Lucy's rations and see what he said then about Henry to the, about Henry the Eighth. No, it would not do the slightest good if he read my manuscript, wrote Ellen Glasgow in her memoir. The best advice I can give you, he said with charming candor, is to stop writing and go back to the South and have some babies. And I think, though I may have heard this ripe wisdom from other men, probably from many, that he added, the greatest woman is not the woman who has written the finest book, but the woman who has had the finest babies. That might be true. I did not stay to dispute it. However, it was true that I also wanted to write books, and not ever had I felt, felt the faintest wish to have babies. Woodhull thought that freedom from sexual coercion would come with the work in, in the marketplace. She was wrong. The marketplace became, as men would have it, another place for sexual intimidation, another arena of danger to women burdened already with too many such arenas. Wolf put her face, faith in education and art. She too was wrong. Many race, misogyny distorts. The intelligence of women is still both punished and despised. Right-wing women have surveyed the world. They find it a dangerous place. They see that work subjects them to more danger from more men. It increases the risk of sexual exploitation. They see that creativity and originality in their kind are ridiculed. They see women thrown out of the circle of male civilization for having ideas, plans, visions, ambitions. They see that traditional marriage means selling to one man, not hundreds, the better deal. They see that the streets are cold and the women on them are tired, sick, and bruised. They see that the money they can earn will still not make them independent of men and they will still have to play the sex games of their kind, at home and at work too. They see no way to make their bodies authentically, authentically their own and to survive in the world of men. They know too that the left has nothing better to offer. Leftist men also want wives and whores. Leftist men value whores too much and give wives too little. Or, and wives too little. Right-wing women are not wrong. They fear that the left, in stressing impersonal sex and promiscuity as values, will make them more val vulnerable to male sexual aggression, and that they will be despised for not liking it. They are not wrong. Right-wing women see that within the system in which they live, they cannot make their bodies their own, but they can agree to the privatized male ownership, keep it on a one-to-one, -one, as it were. They know that they are valued for their sex, their sex organs, and their reproductive capacity, and so they try to up their value. Through cooperation, manipulation, conformity, through displays of affection or attempts at friendship, through submission and obedience, and especially through the use of the euphemism, femininity, total woman, good, maternal instinct, motherly love. Their desperation is quiet. They hide their bruises of body and heart. They dress carefully and have good manners. They suffer. They love God. They follow the rules. They see that intelligence displayed in a woman is a flaw, that intelligence realized in a woman is a crime. They see the world they live in, and they are not wrong. They use sex and babies to stay valuable because they need a home, food, clothing. They use traditional intelligence of the female animal, not human. They do what they have to, to survive. Whew, we made it all the way through. Thanks for sticking with me. I hope that you have so many things to say about this. I hope that it's sparked all kinds of thoughts and feelings and that you get them out. Feel free to share them in the comments. I just cannot get enough of hearing about what other people think and feel. So please do share. All right. Mwah!